Good morning, everybody. Welcome to service today. Uh, we want to welcome you in. We know that God's prepared something to say to you through these words and through this music and through the sermon. And we pray, our prayer is that that would touch your heart and give you tools to go about this world in a deeper relationship with God. To start that, we thought we'd start with an exciting and uplifting song. So if everybody could, everybody could uh, stand up and get ready to sing, let's sing House of the Lord.
Let's make a clean start with God today by confessing our sins to him in the words, uh, the ancient words, pardon me, of uh, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Dear friends, hear these words of forgiveness for you from God as found in Psalm 103. The Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. 
He does not repay us as our sins deserve or uh, repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Please be seated. Today's reading is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 to 24. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. 
Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Good morning. So we had a holiday on Friday. Do you guys know what day that was? What day was it? Remembrance Day, that's right. And it's the day that Canada sets aside to observe um, people that have served us in the military, people that have given their lives, their time for our freedom. And what kind of uh, symbol do we have? The poppy, that's right. That's right. So I was looking up a little bit of facts about Remembrance Day. It started in 1919. It was first called Armistice Day. And because of the uh, agreement to end the First World War that was written on the 11th month, the 11th day of the 11th month at the 11th hour, and that's why we observed our two minutes of silence. Did any of you guys do that? I have to say for years, and it's not like it's a, a happy thing, but it's something that I really is very meaningful when you sit there and you think about what's gone on to give us freedom. And what do you think about when you think about freedom? You can go do whatever you want? Kind of, right? We can't break laws, but we can choose what career we have, where we live. We can choose so many things, what school we're going to go to, and all those things. And then we wear the poppy. It was uh, from a, a poem that was written by a man named John McRae, who wrote it about a place called In Flanders Fields, and the poppies grow there. Have you guys heard that poem maybe at school? Yeah, they say it's one of the most repeated poems in the world. Yeah, so many things about Remembrance Day. So I was thinking about all those things, and then I read the reading for church today, and it said, Christ gave his life for you. Hmm, what a connection. So the whole world celebrates Remembrance Day and all those people that have served and given their lives for us so we can have freedom. And I was watching the TV, and they have all those ceremonies, and the song they play is um, Abide With Me. They're talking about God abiding in us. Huh, what a connection. And I think that that's one thing that we have to remember, what Christ did for us so we can have freedom. Not freedom to go and do what we want to do, but freedom from our sins, freedom to know that we have a goal of heaven. The greatest gift is that forgiveness of sins that God's given us through what he's done in Jesus. All right, let's have a prayer. Dear God, help us to remember, help us to remember every day what you did when you gave us your son Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and we can come to you and ask for that forgiveness that gives us a great freedom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Also, we have Sunday school today and I will meet you over there. We meet in the back and then we're usually done by the time that service ends.
Well, we get to dig into God's Word, which is an awesome thing. And if you'd like to follow along with the message, you can find uh, sermon notes on our church app. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, what a wonderful thing it is that you speak to us through your Word. And as we reflect on your Word in the quietness of these moments that we have together, We pray that you would help us to hear what it is that you are saying to us. We pray that by your Spirit you would plant your word deep in our hearts and help us to live by it. For you indeed have the words of eternal life. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior, we ask this. And all God's people said, Amen. So today we are on the second last sermon in the series called Transforming. Uh, So we started off looking at the why and the what and the how of uh, spiritual formation, how spiritual formation can give us hope uh, for the transformation that we both need and want in life. And then uh, we started looking at how uh, God transforms our mind, both our emotions and our thoughts, and then our uh, will, and then our body. And so if you've missed any of those uh, messages and you want to uh, catch up, or if you want to see them again, you can find them on our website or on our church app in the form of sermon podcasts. Uh, Today we're thinking about how God transforms our social dimension, our relationships. And I want to give credit to where credit is due in a big... uh, resource that I've been using uh, throughout this series is the book um, Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. Now, for those of you who are hockey fans or have a hockey fan in your house, you know that the NHL hockey season has already started. Am I correct? Yes. And the thing about the NHL hockey season, at least early in the season, is that most fans of most teams are optimistic. It was optimistic. Optimistic that their team will win the Stanley Cup. I mean, it seemed like just a few weeks ago, even us Canuck fans were hopeful. And uh, the reason why we get so excited over this Stanley Cup is because it's the trophy that's given to the winner of the Stanley Cup playoffs, and they have this wonderful ceremony at the end of uh, the series, when the last game has been won. And some of you know this already. Uh, Gary Bettman comes out to a chorus of boos, and he gives the trophy to the captain of the winning team, and then what does the captain do? over the head, like this, and skates around, and everybody's cheering, especially if they want it at home. And then what they do is they pass it to someone else. And usually it's a player on the team who's played for a long time and never had the opportunity to lift the Stanley Cup before. And then from that player or players, it gets passed to the next players and the next player and the next player until all of the players get to hoist the Stanley Cup over their head. But it doesn't stop there because the coaches and the assistant coaches, they all get to do that too. And then even the trainers get to lift the Stanley Cup over their head and celebrate. And the reason for that is the NHL recognizes that the victories of a team are shared with all the members of a team. So what about relationships? Maybe you've never thought of it in this way before, but life is a team sport. And all of us have this web of relationships that we are connected to. But what does a win look like in terms of our relationships? I mean, does it mean we get what we want from those relationships? And God, who created us, he might have something to say, or he might have an idea about what a good relationship looks like. So then what does, uh, how can our social context be transformed so that it's a win 
for God, for others, and for us. And so that's what we're going to be thinking about uh, today during our time of reflection. And the verse that's going to be guiding us is this one from 1 John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So the first point that we need to kind of sit on for a while is that our social context, our relationships need to be transformed. And here's why. We all need to be connected to people who are for us, who support us, who are there when we need them. And when we have those people in our lives, those, that quality and kind of uh, relationship, then what happens is we're able to flourish as human beings. And so Dallas Willard calls these uh, circles of relationships, he calls them circles of sufficiency because when those relationships are giving us what we need, then uh, we can kind of blossom and grow as a human being. And these circles are kind of in a series of concentric circles. The first and most important one is the relationship between a mother and a child. That one is key. But also that mother and child needs the support of the larger family in order to make their relationship what it is needs to be. And the larger family needs the support of the community that surrounds them. And the community really needs the support of the world. So there's all these concentric circles. And if all of them were functioning as God intended, we wouldn't have relational problems. But broken people are only able to have broken relationships. And so this means that all of our circles of sufficiency are broken. They're now insufficient. They're not what God intended them to be. And this is the case with the world, with the community, with their larger family, and even between parents and children. And then here's what happens when our circles of sufficiency are broken we experience the opposite of someone being for us. We experience rejection. And it may be the case that the per person we're in a relationship didn't even intend for us to feel that way, but that's how we feel. And this rejection that we experience creates a wound on our soul. And then wounded by rejection, what happens is we then tend to inject a couple of sin poisons into our relationships. And those sin poisons are assault and withdrawal. And these two relationship toxins are so common in our world today that we think that they're normal that this is just the way that uh, relationships are supposed to be. So what is assault and withdrawal? So uh, Dallas Willard defines assault as when we act against the good of someone else, even with their consent. And so the second half of the Ten Commandments kind of describes for us what it means to do good for other people. And so it's that kind of thing. It's, it's the kind of thing that Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. It's uh, what Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians 13, when we truly love one another. So when we're doing those kinds of things for someone else, we are acting for their good. And assault is doing the opposite of what's good for the other person. Now, withdrawal is when we consider someone else's goodness and well-being to be of no concern to us. 
we just simply disregard them. We may even despise them. And the thing with assault and withdrawal is we probably think in terms of, you know, physically withdrawing or physically assaulting someone, but the thing that we really, really need to watch with both of these things is our words. Because a verbal assault can cause a deeper and longer lasting wound than a physical blow. And withdrawal, uh, it... We, I mean, I know I do these things myself, and I don't even consider the impact of what I'm doing is having on someone else. So withdrawal, what it looks like in terms of words is the silent treatment. Anybody ever seen anything like the silent treatment? That's withdrawal by words, and it hurts the other person when we do that. So the second thing that's really important is, yes, we need uh, transformation in our relationships, in our social context, but God can do it with his love. And here's the standard that we're aiming for as followers of Jesus Christ. We want to fulfill his words that he spoke in John 13, verses 34 to 35, when he said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, that's what we're aiming for with our lives, but that is also a tall order. And it can seem intimidating to us, but God doesn't mean it to be that way. And let me explain how he intends for us to do what Jesus is uh, calling us to do here. First of all, God the Father sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world. First and foremost, to pay the full cost of forgiveness for all of our sins so that that sin barrier between us and God could be totally removed. And then what Jesus Christ did was he exchange places with us, not only in suffering on the cross in our place, but also in terms of his status as God's son. He became fully human so that we could be children of God. And so to put it in the form of a a chart, I'll show you that in a minute. But the the, the reason why this is so significant is because the Father, God is one. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always existed for all of eternity in a divine community of love. Uh, Some uh, Bible teachers call it the perichoresis, which means kind of like a divine dance of love. And so forever, the Father has loved the Son, the Son has loved the Father, the Father has loved the Spirit, the Spirit has loved the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit love each other as well. And so this agape love is the unconditional, choosing, self-giving, sacrificial love that the Father and the Son and the Spirit have always been loving each other with. And so that's how the Bible can say that not only does God love us, but God is love. Because there's love within this community of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Always has been, always will be. And so uh, what uh, the situation is when we're living the without God life is we're outside of his family. And so our circle of sufficiency, our our relationships are broken, we're broken, and there we are. But God opened up the door to his agape love for all humanity through his son, Jesus Christ. And so what Jesus is, he's our gateway into the family. And he brings us into the family of God so that our ultimate circle 
of sufficiency is now the love that we have from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is exactly how things ought to be. And so we have God surrounding us with his love, and we bring all of our broken relationships into that life with God, but everything has changed for us because of Jesus Christ. And what I mean by that is now, even though we're broken and the people all around us are all broken too, now we know that God loves us. And we're receiving his love in our lives. And then because of that, we love the people around us in a different way. We love our family differently than we did before. We love our community differently than we did before. We love our world differently than we did before. Because God is our circle of sufficiency. We are supported by his love. We know that he is for us and with us. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. So God's agape love heals the wounds in our soul. And it also helps us to see the importance of connecting with others because it's through our relationships with others that we are able to share the, God, the love God gives us with them. And God's agape love enables us to love others with his love. But then let's talk a little bit more about the the healing piece, because all of us need God's love to heal our souls, especially in terms of our relationships. So we're within the family of God. God's circle of sufficiency is supporting us, carrying us throughout our lives. But then we're not there alone. We're also there with other people who have been brought into God's family through Jesus Christ, who also have God as their ultimate circle of sufficiency. And what I am talking about is the Christian church. Now, an important distinction needs to be made between what has been called the visible and the invisible church. Because the visible church is the churches that you see on various corners and communities around the world. But the invisible church is every person who believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the sad truth is that in some visible churches, people have not experienced the healing power of the love of God. They have instead been wounded in a deeper way. But what I want to hold before you, dear sisters and brothers, is that God has, through, your, through his son Jesus Christ, brought you into his invisible Christian church. And it is there, as you relate to other people who are also living with Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior and their source of the healing love that they need, it is there that healing happens in our relationship with God and in our relationships with other people. Because God's agape love is made complete when love flows from us to others and then from others to us. And when we're in that kind of a situation, when we're surrounded by people who we know are for us and love us and actually see us as God sees us. And then we're able to love them as well with the love God has poured into our hearts. That's when our wounds are healed. So we need to have healing in our relationships. God can do it with his love and the wholeness that we have in Jesus is the key. What do I mean by that? Well, this is the spiritual formation part. 
And what I'm talking about here is forming habits where we do things like the ones I'm going to be talking about. And that is we make a habit of identifying and understanding what is wrong in our relationships. So we ask ourselves, are we assaulting others with our words or with our actions? And if we are, then we need to dig a little deeper because this wound often happens at a very early age, the wound that assaulting comes from. And it comes when two wills are conflicted. So imagine uh, two brothers fighting over the same toy. And maybe that kind of uh, rivalry over that toy uh, leads into different kind of rivalries later on in life. And they get angry with one another. And they don't deal with their anger, and so it begins to become ingrained uh, resentment. And that can result in things like lying, stealing, uh, murder, adultery, or ingrained covetousness. This is exactly, dear friends, what happened with Cain and Abel. And spiritual formation, when we recognize this kind of thing in our own life, spiritual formation means asking Jesus to help us to become a person who simply does not assault others because it's not part of who we are anymore. And we need his help to get there. So secondly, we could ask ourselves, are we with drawing from others. So this too is a form of lovelessness. But it, there's a nuance here. It needs a different kind of healing. Because if we are withdrawing from others, what's going on is there's something, some kind of a weakness in us. It could be fear. It could be uh, anxiety. Um, I know there's sometimes when I withdraw because I feel like I need to protect myself. That's coming out of fear. And if we're finding those kinds of things within ourselves, the only thing that will heal it is the agape love and power of God. And then as Jesus does his work within us, and brings healing to our soul, then what we do is we, we get rid of those toxins of assault and withdrawal. Like we purge them from our lives as far as that is possible. And we replace them with relating to others with blessing and goodwill. Because that is what God has always intended for our relationships with other people to be. To be arenas within which blessing can happen as we treat others with goodwill and then seek to help them in ways that they need and are appropriate for us to do. And healing for the world needs to begin in our marriages for those of us who are married. Because Men and women don't know how to love each other. There is this sense in the world that, um, yes, I need to give when I'm married to someone else, but in the back of our mind, we're thinking, I'm giving in order for me to get something back, maybe accomplish some kind of goals that I have, or maybe so I can feel more fulfilled. And then what happens is, we're empty because we're not getting what we expect to get out of our marriages. And then those toxins of assault and withdrawal start seeping in. And then imagine what happens when a child is raised in that environment. They grow up to be hardened because they're wounded as well. 
And then they start wounding the next generation. And the cycle goes on and on and on and on. But the ideal that God has for marriage is for husbands and wives to love each other in mutual submission in awe of Jesus' love for them. And so if you're thinking about getting married or if you're in marriage, you ought to know, in our marriage, you ought to know marriage is a place where brave people go to die. I'm serious. It's actually a perfect place to die to yourself and then to love and support that other person unconditionally with God's love. So that they can fulfill their role as a spouse. And if you have a child, that's the perfect environment for that child. It's it's an environment of, of safety and nourishment. And that child will grow up knowing that their parents are for them. And the first safe environment for a child is its mother's womb. And then after he or she is born, the second safe environment for the child is the family home. And the father plays a role in help making that happen. And so husbands and wives lay down their lives for each other so that they can be the spouse and the parent that God has called them to be. And if we're able to do this, if men and women are able to love each other properly, that healing will spread throughout the entire world. Now, there's four elements to redeemed relationships that Dallas Willard identifies. The first is we see ourselves as whole in Jesus Christ. And this is because this is the way that God sees us. And this is challenging because we know our flaws. But the truth of the matter is that Jesus Christ has made us whole. And in Colossians 3, 3 to 4, uh, we read, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, so we're talking about at the resurrection at the end of time, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so even though we have these frail bodies that get sick and wrinkled and old, the truth of the matter is we are already made whole by Jesus Christ and we are living our whole life in him right now. And at the end of time, Everyone else will see it. So the first thing is we see ourselves as whole. Second thing is we abandon all defensiveness. This means all efforts to try and get our own way, all uh, kinds of manipulation, all uh, patterns we tend to have of making ourselves look good. We just, like, get rid of them all. We take off the mask that we all tend to wear and we just be ourselves before other people. And then genuine love predominates in our Christian gatherings. So XN is an is a abbreviation for Christian. And again, this is those uh, gatherings of the invisible church, those genuine believers in Jesus Christ. And in Romans 12, uh, God gives us a whole list of uh, things that describe how We as followers of Jesus ought to love one another. But here's a sample. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And then uh, fourth and finally, we open our relationships with non-Christians to God's healing. So this means that uh, in our everyday lives, as we go about the world, we are open to God's agape love flowing through us into the lives of people who may not even believe in Jesus just yet. 
but we have those kinds of opportunities because of where God has placed us. So Dr. Richard Salzer uh, had to operate on a young woman who had a tumor in her cheek. And in order to get all of the tumor, he had to cut a facial nerve. And this meant that after the operation was over, uh, the young woman's face was kind of twisted in a clownish sort of way. And she looked at her face in the mirror and uh, she said, is it always going to be this way? And Dr. Selzer said, yes, it is. I had to cut the nerve in order to get all of the tumor. And she was silent for a while. She didn't say anything. But her husband was in the room. And he says, I kind of like it. I think it's cute. And then what he did is he bent over to kiss his wife. And Dr. Selzer was so close, he could see that the husband contorted his face so that his lips matched hers so he could show her that their kiss still worked. And this is what love does. Love contorts itself out of shape for the sake of the other. And so the divine Son of God, Jesus Christ, contorted himself into a human body and then lovingly, willingly let that body be hung on a cross where it was twisted again as he suffered and died on the cross because he loves you. He is for you. He is with you. And he became part of the team of humanity in order to bring you onto Team Jesus. And so remember those things that we talked about that our social context needs to be transformed. God can do it with his love and the wholeness we have in Jesus is the key. And so the challenge I want to leave you with you today is to embrace the wholeness that you have in Jesus. Live in it because it's real and it's yours. And then share his love with others. And remember the victories of a team are shared with all the members of the team. That's what Jesus has done for us. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for bringing us onto your team and for sharing with us your victories that you have won, victories of uh, forgiveness and salvation and eternal life for all humanity. And then, Lord, help us to remember always who we are in you and to love from the wholeness that you give us with your unconditional choosing self-giving love so that the world would not only know you but in knowing you and your love be healed in your precious and holy and matchless name we ask this and all God's people said amen so here at Walnut Grove Lutheran Church, our vision is to be a church that helps people of all generations to be passionate about, equipped for, and effective at transforming lives for the kingdom of God. Uh, if you would like to support us in that work that we're doing together, it takes all of our prayers and our energy and our gifts and some time, uh, but also takes some finances. And so if you want to be a financial partner for the work that God has given us to do, you can give online at wglc.org slash donate. Or if you haven't done so already and you'd like to set up an ongoing giving relationship, uh, you can do that by emailing our church office at admin at wglc.org. Or if you brought your offering with you today, uh, there's a basket on the side table and you can drop it in there as uh, you exit today. I invite you to stand if you're able. 
And let's enter into a time of prayer. And as we do that, you'll notice on your screen a list of uh, people's names who we are praying for on an ongoing basis. I invite you to uh, cast your eyes upon uh, the people listed there, and let's begin with a few few moments of uh, silent prayer. Dear Lord, we pray for peace in our troubled world. We think, uh, especially of the people in Ukraine, uh, many of whom are uh, suffering without heat or power. And Lord, we pray not only for that conflict to end, but we pray that what the people there need for life would somehow be provided for them. And we pray that you would give your wisdom and guidance to leaders around the world who are seeking to deal with this and other very challenging uh, problems. We pray for all those who are grieving. We lift up before you Stephen, Laura, H., and their family who are grieving the death of their son, Aaron. And for Terry and John L. and their family who are grieving the death of Terry's dad, Bruno. And for Eric and Julie B. and their family who are grieving the death of Eric's dad, Stan. And we thank you, Jesus, that in moments like this, because of you and your love for us and for the whole world, we have that sure and certain promise of eternal life in you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would comfort those who are grieving with your presence and your promise of eternal life. We pray, Lord, for all those who are grieving. We lift up before you Emily S., whose non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and stomach cancer has returned We also pray a prayer of thanksgiving for John and Stephanie uh, over the safe delivery of their infant son. Please watch over them and keep them safe. We pray for Earl, who's uh, suffering with kidney stones, and for Dave S.'s mom. We pray for healing for Michelle G. uh, and her broken ankle. We also pray for Carol's dad, Norm, and for Jacqueline M., who has a brain tumor. And Lord, you are the great physician and the source of all healing power. And so we pray that you would bless our loved ones with your healing touch, that you would hold them close and carry them through the challenging times that they are facing. We pray for all those who are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ around the world, and and we include ourselves in this prayer as we go about our lives in our homes, our workplaces, our schools, and our communities. We also pray for all the pastors in Ukraine and for uh, Reverend Fo Maya Futh, who's the pastor of Garuna Lutheran Church in Preve, Cambodia. We pray, Lord, that you would work in and through all of us with your mighty power, that you would guide us in our words and actions so that as you live and work in and through us, the hearts of more and more people would be drawn closer and closer to you. We pray also for the regional meeting that will be happening at our church this Saturday as uh, Congregations from across the Lower Mainland discuss uh, ways that uh, they can work together to address the challenges that they face in this region as they seek to do ministry. And dear Jesus, we ask that you would help us to receive more of your love and forgiveness so that our lives can be fully directed by you. Guide us both individually and as a church so that we may go and make disciples wherever you have placed us, in our homes, our neighborhoods, where we work, 
and where we play. Lord, we pray all of our spoken and silent prayers in Jesus' name, and we pray as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As our time of worshiping God together comes to an end, and you go out into the world to share God's love with a broken and hurting world, go with this blessing. May God the Father strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And may you, being rooted and established in love, have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of of God. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you both now and forever. Amen.
Please be seated. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, be, hey, Mitch, how old are you? Thirteen. Thirteen. Okay. Um, we have tried to be intentional about mentoring young people at our church. So today we have two camera operators and a drummer who are all 13 or younger. I think we can thank God for that. Uh, the two announcements that I have are, uh, please save the date, November the 27th. We're having a congregational meeting, if I could say the words, after worship. And then I also want to say thank you to everyone who helped out with the fall cleanup yesterday. And remember this week, God loves you. God is with you. And God is for you. Have a great week.